hello um thanks for thanks for watching this is the uh i think this is the seventh one of these i've done now in this payback series um i'm super excited because tonight i'm talking to one of my favorite journalists her name is jude rogers and she is just she's a superstar and I'm sure once we get chatting, let me just get Jude here. Once we get chatting, you're going to realise there are so many articles that you've read and you've loved that are written by Jude. You might not have realised before. Um, let's see. Waiting for Jude. Sup, sup, sup. Hello. Hello, you are right. Ah, oh, all the better for seeing you. How are you? I'm all right. I'm just trying to sort myself out. I've got, I've got, I've got a table here and my wine. I've got a light there. I can't quite see what glasses on. I've got loads of um, children's board games popping up my uh, laptop. So I can sit on the sofa, basically. But, oh, yeah. mate, you're sorted. Look at this. You're comfy. No, I I went wine. For... You went for white wine. Ooh. Oh. I went for one, a red, and I just realised what it says in the bottle. S&M. Oh, no. Anyways, anyways. <laughs> thank I you so... I need hmm? So I'm all right. You, do you don't need them. It's just because I'm currently at my parents' home. And there's loads of oh. kind of chaos going on in the background. I just need to zone out from. So that's, that's why I've got mine in. But oh. um, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it, mate. I really, I'm also, I've been excited all day about <laughs> this because I've been going through so much. I've been going through like so many of your articles that I, some that I actually, I forgot that you had written. And I'm right. just like, oh my, God, I can't wait to ask you about them. So just, unfortunately, right. we only have an hour and we've got loads to get through. So if you don't mind, can you just give us like a brief kind of intro into like, into how you got into music journalism and, yeah. and why? So I was, well, music journalism proper, I was 25. So I was not straight out of school or anything like that. Although I did have, um, a couple of years working for the Llanelli Star newspaper, my local newspaper in South Wales. Um, best job ever. Saturday mornings, I used to go to Woolworths, pick up the chart and type it up, <laughs> which was my favourite job. Um, and oh. uh, yeah, that's, that, that didn't last. But um, I tried to do bits, of, bits and bobs in university, but everybody was more confident than me <laughs> doing reviews and stuff. And I sort of left it behind and did other work. Um, I worked for charities, I worked as a medical secretary for the NHS, and I was just not confident enough to do anything with my writing. But so I, my mum, you know what mums are like, you have a mum, you're from the North East. I got, um, told me once, you know, God's sake, sort yourself out and try and do something with your writing, because that's what you've always loved. And I started a fanzine um, in London with a friend, Matt Haynes, who is a indie record label uh, chap. He ran Sarah Records, the of 80s early 90s indie label who I'd got to know through gigs and stuff we'd set up a little fanzine together about London not about music and basically Word magazine my first music magazine employer um had a technical magazine of the month and I just sent one off and they liked it and I met them and they did a little piece on us and I just was like oh my god it's Mark Ellen and David Hepworth and Paul Denoyer and Andrew Harris and these people from Q magazine and select and all these magazines I'd loved and I was like if you ever need somebody to open the post and make tea please you know, call me and I just keep on annoying them because by that point I was 25 and working for a really corrupt horrible charity up a fire escape in West London and desperate to leave um, and then I got and I got a two-day week job and took a massive pay cut but that was it September 2003 best yeah 30th of September 2003 was best day of my life it was amazing I couldn't believe I was in an office with these people and that was that. And since then, I've been slowly but surely writing about music. First couple of years were a bit quiet. But um, I was just building up little reviews and stuff. But eventually, they let me into the bigger stuff. And it was great. I mean, now you're, at, uh, you're kind of one of the go-to. I, I mean, it's like when it's especially the Guardian pieces as well. And you get some of the biggest names to interview. And there's just... I'm going to jump straight in with one of the one of your most recent interviews, one of your most recent pieces that I read on the Guardian. Um, it's the it's the Mark Lanigan interview, <laughs> and this one I'm just I'm so for many reasons 
for one that you know why I'm so curious because yeah. in this interview with Mark Lanigan you're interviewing him at the at, at his big show his big solo show at the roundhouse and I'm supporting him <laughs> and I was really looking forward to meeting him I've been chatting to him before and and I was like oh we're gonna be best mates that didn't happen there wasn't much conversation between the two of us and then reading your piece in The Guardian, I then realised maybe why he wasn't so chatty. Can you tell us a bit more about the Mark Lennon interview from then oh. and how it transpired and what happens next? Okay, so this was an interview for, I was asked to do in December, the night before. Um, he was going to be in the Roundhouse and he had this gig and I, I don't live in London, I live in Wales. So any job that's offered to me, like my phone needs a lot of planning. Um, but I didn't know that I had, was, I had to basically speed read the book the next morning and then interview him. You know, I know Mark Lanigan, some of his stuff, but not loads of his stuff. So I was, you know, had this ma downloading loads of his stuff off Spotify, <laughs> trying to kind of like get around his whole career. But I was going to be in London anyway for a Christmas drinks, which I didn't want to miss. I like fitted in before that. He was, um, he hadn't, I found it later, he hadn't known I was coming until the day. Um, he was really nervous for the gig. Uh, it was a massive gig for him. Um, he, you know, didn't, his wife was really ill at the time and I didn't know that and he didn't tell me that. Um, she was in hospital in another country. And in the middle of all this, he has these, he's signing all the front pages of this book and he doesn't want to talk about the book because it was such a wrench to write. This is his um, 10 years from when he, the 10 years he lived in Seattle after he left his hometown in Washington state. And it's the start of the Screaming Trees up to him becoming friends with Kirk Cobain. And, you know, these are massive stories. You know, he, I'm speed reading this book that has all this stuff in about Kirk Cobain calling him the day that he committed suicide and not, uh, and Mark not answering the phone. Anyway, so it's all this stuff and I'm gonna deal with all this. And I know he's a difficult person to interview because I've read, I've been speed reading other interviews with him. Um, and yeah, strangely enough, he wasn't really into it. Um, it was, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was really tough. And I, my general um, interview technique to go in is like, hiya, how are you doing? You all right? <laughs> you know, friendly conversational stuff. <laughs> and he was back in this backstage room and just didn't look at me. He was looking in the mirror. I should put at this point that I interviewed him again um, in March when um, an al the album that's come out recently to accompany the book came out because that wasn't announced at the time. He was lovely on the phone. He was really apologetic about that day. He said, you did, you prepared loads of great questions, even though you'd only read the book in the morning. He was annoyed that I hadn't read the book for long and all this stuff. So he was kind of just generally annoyed and pissed off and worried about his wife and the gig and stuff. But, and he apologized to me on Twitter after I put the interview out. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. I was, yeah, that was a, that was a moment. Yeah. But um, I thought, and I saw you in the middle of the interview, Nadine, didn't I? You saw yeah. me. Oh, my God. You, you know, he was having, having one of three cigarettes that he was pain smoking. And you walk out and it's like, oh, hello, Jude, how you doing? I don't know. With my dictaphone trying to get anything for this interview. Oh, God. Yeah, I could have sabotaged it there. But then it, after the interview had finished, I kind of I got you because I went the backstage bit. And then I'm in my tiny dressing room down the down the corridor, and uh, I just you looked. I mean, I've we've met on many occasions with you interviewing me, or I've seen you at music events and things like that. And you know, anybody who has met you or anyone who sees you now, you do have this like glorious, happy disposition, which I think is a really great. It's really great for people you're interviewing as well because your energy it, it's, it's it's infectious. It's really lovely to be around. Very nice. And I hadn't seen you look that way ever after you'd interviewed him. And you looked, you know, <laughs> almost not, I wouldn't say broken, but like <laughs> a, a, a bit done in. You looked a bit done in, at which at point I just said, like, do you, do you want to just come and have a quick glass of wine in my dressing room with us? And you were like, yeah. And I poured massive glasses of wine. It was, and, and you were saying, like, it was just a very harrowing conversation to have and I flicked through parts of his of his book and any page I go to it's like holy sh there there's extreme stories and then you're kind of privy to that in this environment when he's got all this other stuff going on and so I can imagine that has a profound effect on you and he wants to say you know you asked him a question about something and he said you know it's all in the book because I don't want to be interviewed about it which is completely valid but then I'm the journalist who has to kind of 
ask him about, so tell me about how, you know, how do you feel when Kirk complains? Da, 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 da. You know, it's, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was hard. But, you know, I knew that there was this, it's funny when you're in those situations, you think, well, this is part of the story, actually. You know, I'm in this situation. I can write about this. I, I, I'm, I'm always desperate not to make people look bad for the sake of it. You know, I can have, I'm really, really careful there. And you know, I think early on in my career, you know, I, not that I've done any stitch-up jobs on anybody, but there's been some, you know, when you, when you start out, you think you should maybe kind of be a bit controversial and kind of, um, you know, have strong opinions about people. And then, you know, it can, can come back to butt you on the arse a bit, really. I, think I interviewed Tori Amos very early on in my career, and I was a bit too full on about how full on she was. And she's I, Tori Amos fan, carry on. Yeah, and she's, um, you know, she was telling me about how she'd met Lucifer and all this stuff. And, and the interview was one of the biggest nightmares to, to organise ever. But I had an editor at the time who was just encouraging me to say, oh, you know, say the organised interview's been a nightmare and say how she was a nightmare there. And I was pushed, I felt like I was pushed a little bit too far in that direction, really. Um, because I was a huge Tori Amos fan when I was 13 or 14. You know, I kind of, I had the, well, no, a bit older than that, actually. I had a friend, um, Dan, who had the kind of piano books to her music, and I'd be there trying to play, you know, Cornflake <laughs> or something really badly. But um, I was really excited to meet her. And later on, I found out I was on her band list. She never wanted me to interview her. <laughs> what? And I, but oh, I would not. I would not, you know, if this is true or not, but I, I get it from the interview I did with her. You know, I didn't put anything libelous on here like that, but I just was like, she was crazy. And yeah, she is kind of, a, you know, I, an eccentric musician. She's on her own plane. That's fine. You know, pop, pop stars should be like that. You know, I, we want to have lots of different people in the great world of music. And she's made some amazing music. And I regret that. But generally, because of experiences like that, I know you've got to tread a bit more carefully because that's a human being you know then again if somebody is complete you know wazuk, then they will get it you know <laughs> yeah i think yeah well i think it's like it's the, the more of these that i do and like a better picture that i'm getting of your point of view and like and how how it works as a music journalist because this is an art that we need to fight for so much at the moment um mm. but you do come across it's like you know you, there are you are like anybody, we're going to have good days and we're going to have bad days. And you can catch somebody on a bad day and then go, oh, they were an arsehole. No, actually, they're not. They're just, you know, something really oh. bad's just happened to them. I mean, have you ever, like, there must have been times, even, even this is the thing, not just the artist who's being interviewed, but as the journalist who goes in, there has to be points where, where you're going in to do an interview and you're having a bad day, but you've still got to do the job because, you know, Nick Cave won't be there tomorrow or Tori Amos <laughs> won't be there tomorrow. So you've still got to do that job. Have you ever had an experience where it's like, I just don't want to do this today? Oh, or, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I have. I've had, um, I remember interviewing Robin uh, with Y on my birthday. Yeah. And, and I was kind of like, I've had a, I can't remember. I'd had a really terrible morning getting over then. She was not particularly into talking and that was disappointing um the worst example the best example of this slash the worst example of this is um i interviewed paul mccartney for q magazine for a cover for q it was a it was a phone interview that's all right you know it, you know still it was like if i met him in person i probably would just be like that you know i wouldn't be able to say anything um but yeah that was really difficult being a freelancer is quite weird because you're always kind of trying to you send me off to you an interview trying to fit it around your life anyway and that day um, I was in the early stages of pregnancy. I was a, le a lecturing part-time. I used to do lecturing as well in feature writing, things like that, on various journalism courses. I'd organised this big event in the afternoon. I got a call that lunch. I'm saying, the Paul McCartney interview's on. It's five o'clock. And I was hosting this event. And also, I was about seven weeks pregnant. And a few days before, I'd had a bit of bleeding, and I was a bit worried about it. But the doctors said it was fine. Literally, I ran out of this hosting this event five minutes early, you hand it up to somebody else, so I can go and interview Paul McCartney. Uh, you know, this might be a bit too much detail, but kind of like, yeah, I'll go to the bathroom. It's obvious that I'm probably starting to have a miscarriage. <laughs> and I was like, what do I do? Do I call the PR? Do I do this? And I'm like, I can't, it's Paul McCartney. I've got to do it. So I do this 20 minute interview and I've prepared for it. I've prepared for it so much. I'm really ready for it. And I do this interview and, um, 
and then after it I just like sit there for 20 minutes going oh my god it's so weird and you know it's weird enough when you're hearing Paul McCartney's voice on the phone you're trying not to, to back to him in his own voice you know <laughs> um yeah. it's probably one of the best interviews I wrote I did, you know, because I didn't write it after a while. My editor was lovely about it because obviously I, I did have this miscarriage and kind of, um, and I, you know, physically all right. But kind of, I remember writing up that interview and I was like, I'm going to make this really good and I'm going to try. And I'd asked him questions to try and get him to say something new, which is, you know, pretty hard. Where's Paul McCartney? But, but yeah, it was, it was quite, that was quite a weird situation. And I know other women who've been in similar situations like that in interviews. Um, Sylvia Patterson in her book, was in um, her amazing memoir, kind of writes about when this happened at her, when she was interviewing Mariah Carey. <laughs> so, you know, the situation not exactly the best in that. You know, I mean, I'm, la I'm, I'm but, laughing. It's not funny. It, this is. No, but but I, does I, it. It's weird, you know, it, that, happened, that happened, you know, and kind of. Um, but it, kind of, it does make you think, you know, wow, um, my life is pretty surreal <laughs> sometimes. Lucky your life is your life is so surreal and it's these kind of things and I when I speak to you and other journalists about it I'm like you know you've got all this guy. but I, I guess then um, I mean I can only guess I can't imagine how that must have been Jude I can't imagine that must have been for you but uh, also it's just kind of you know you then hmm? I was just looking back I was really proud of that interview you know kind of um I did it and it was I, and I've still got I've got it at my office I look at it sometimes I think you know you managed to do that that's really good and you know, but also, you know, what a joy it was the first job I did back. I said, right, you've got to write up an interview with Paul McCartney. I'm so excited and proud. And my mum was so delighted. And, you know, it was just. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like it just kind of shows your strength there. And it's like, okay, despite this, which could be one of the most harrowing things that's probably ever going to happen in my life, I'm still capable of doing this and putting my shit together. And then, yeah, bloody hell, that's an interview you're not going to forget anytime soon. Yeah. Was there. Um, I mean, there's, there's just, there's a ton, there's a ton of interviews that you've done where I'm just like, I can't believe, because you've, you've been to people's homes as well, yeah. you know, yeah. and like, because oh, th 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 there's, there's things that you put in interviews, right, that you put in the article, there must be things that you leave out. So you went to um, the, the Marianne Faithful interview. Yeah. Are you actually in her apartment in Paris? Yeah, 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 yeah. Please tell us about that. Oh, God, it was amazing. And you're just looking, you walk into this flat. <gasps> I'm trying, you know, I'm going to try and put all these details in. I remember this, this is amazing, like, like 90, early 20th century, tiny lift. And, you know, this <sighs> other piles of books everywhere. And stuff. I just wanted to just make notes about every single thing that was in her house. You know, the fact that her, her bed, half of her bed has books on. Because she doesn't, she just sleeps in half the bed. And the other half, she just has loads of hardback books as she reads. Um, but there's also, you know, with, with her, you know, she was obviously quite fragile and quite vulnerable, actually. You know, she'll be there kind of going, oh, I don't give a shit about this. But she is quite fragile and vulnerable. And that came clear in interviews with other people. But, you know, there's a, she, she, she knows that and there's a strength in that. Um, and I really wanted to get that across. But um, I was just brilliant. I, just, I, you know, I love going to people's bathrooms and just having a bit of a nose, you know. Yes. Chrissy Hines bathroom I was like oh look at all these cleansers wow <laughs> totally you're just like oh she's using oh using uh, molten brown doing all right <laughs> they, they, well, those are the kind of like the the daft little bits that you want it because the, the things that you don't write because mm. you can't write because that's you know it's a bit lame to write all that stuff oh and you had but these are the bits that you know that kind of you're 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 piecing together this person I suppose and I just love that it's that Marianne Faithful one I think uh, do you choose the headings or is it editing? Because in that one, you don't. Yeah, because in that one, it's like Marianne Faithful. And then, and then she yeah, has a quote from her, which is, this is the most honest record I've made. It's open heart <laughs> surgery, darling. I like, oh, does everything yeah. that she says end with darling? Yeah, yeah. She was, yes. it was interviews where you just, she's just saying things. And I'm kind of going, yes, that's the poll quote. Yes. Um, yeah, she was just hilarious. And, and I, sadly, I wasn't there very long. I kind of had come from Wales to London that morning, got the, the Eurostar to Paris, was there in a flat for like an hour and a half and had to go back because I would have happily stayed there. Um, and, you know, stuff I, the stuff I didn't put in was stuff that, you know, she obviously wanted us to stay a bit longer and, 
you know, there's quite a lot about her loneliness. But the album was about loneliness. But I, I, find, I find with women I write about, I don't want to stress stuff that goes over into like tabloid material. You always have to think, right, this is an interview with Marion Faithful. There might be people who work for, not every, there are great people who work for tabloids, there really are. But could have, there might be some people who might take a quote from this interview and turn it into something else. And I, you've got to think it like that, even if you're writing for the Observer New Review. Um, so I didn't want to dwell on her vulnerability. And I didn't want to talk so much about Mick Jagger. Um, I remember I got the proof back for that piece and there were lots of pictures of her and Mick Jagger. And I said, could we have some more pictures of her throughout her career? You know, and I, and I know that's not my job to do that. And I know people will want to read a piece by her because that's her most famous period. But I really was determined, like, let's talk about her other albums because I'd spend lots of time listening to other bits of her back catalogue. She does some amazing music and a lot of which I hadn't known before doing that piece. Um, like uh, another person, I interviewed for, well, I've interviewed a couple of times, uh, Kat Power. I interviewed her for oh. Word about 2006, around the time The Great is coming out. I interviewed her for Q magazine in maybe 2013 when The Sun album came out, both, you know, amazing records. Um, but at both times, she wasn't having a great time. And I really didn't want to make that the story, even though that was sort of the story. And I found those pieces quite difficult to put together. Kat Power did finish the interview, the first interview in 2006 with me by kind of open bathroom door and just going for a pee in front of me and just pulling a pants and having a walk. <laughs> and I did start the piece with that, put in then 2006. But it's interesting, 2013, I didn't actually, I didn't do that. I, 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 I thought this, her album Son, I think is amazing. And I really didn't want it to be about her boyfriend just broken up with her and blah, 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 blah. And that does happen more with, women than with men. The editor then wasn't terrible, I should say, but kind of, um, you're just conscious of it. And I don't know if it's because, I think female journalists are conscious of it because you think about how, there's a lot more of us now writing for mainstream titles than the one when I started, which is amazing. But um, you are, you know, you do kind of want to protect the women you write about a bit. No, it's a really, be I'm, well, I'm really glad that you're around for that because so often it's even, even the slightest detail, which is actually really significant when it's, um, I'm using myself as an example, but I'm making one up. The beautiful Nadine Shah, the stunning Laura Marling. The, and you know, and what? And like, it has to, they ha you have to talk about their aesthetic before mentioning who they are and what they do. And I found with every female journalist who's ever written about me or written about women that I love, there's not a focus on what they look like. There's, it's not, it's not like, Nadine Shaw, 34. It, there's no mention of age straight off either. Yeah. I've never been asked by a woman why I don't have children. <laughs> but I have been asked by male journalists why I don't. Um, you know yeah. what, women's magazines in the past, I have been asked to ask that question. And I've been asked to ask about, um, you know, what are you thinking about the future? You, do you think you get married and all that stuff? And I just, you know, basically, either ask that in a very in a way that doesn't actually ask that, or kind of just say they didn't want to talk about. It. <laughs> you know, but um, yeah, women's magazines have changed a lot since I've been you know writing as well. You know, it used to be like, can you describe what their skin looks like? I was asked once about this wasn't about a musician, it's about an actor. I was like, you know, pink. I don't know. <laughs> it's just a, on uh, a face. rough as a badger's ass. This is ridiculous. <laughs> That's ridiculous. And then, how much does how much does editing come into play? Because like you deliver, you you know, you spend your time with this person, then you write it all up, which I imagine is a really boring task. <laughs> Sorry, and then and then it's then you present it, and then it's edited. Yeah, and that 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 could surely that can really significantly change the article. Yeah, um, but you know, editors generally are they're pilloried a bit too much. I I think I think editors actually do. A, bloody good job on, on, on the whole. You know, yeah. I have a in the past who've completely butchered, you know, I think anyway, <laughs> butchered my copy. Um, yeah. In the early days, you know, there have been editors, like sub-editors who just take my jokes out or maybe they weren't good enough, though, to be honest, or insert <laughs> in without telling me and I hated that. You know, it's like, if you're going to, if you're going to change my copy, just send me it, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm really lucky now. My editors will send it, you know, they'll, they'll say, this is what I've done. They'll send me a draft of it. And if there's anything I really disagree with, I'll, I'll say, you know, my main editors, you know, 
Ben and Laura at The Guardian, uh, Sarah Donaldson and Jane Ferguson, The Observing Review, they're amazing. They'll always say, they quite often send, you know, the, the proof so you can see the pictures. I've got a big piece in The Observer on the weekends and I'm, they've sent me the, you know, it was all, all laid out, ready to go. And I love that because it's like, we've done it together and, you know, it's really nice. Yeah, what's... Yeah, sometimes. But, but, you know, you can also get, you'll do an interview and somebody will pull out a quote from it and put it as a headline. You go, oh my God, I never thought of that. It looks amazing. It's quite exciting, really. I did an, probably my favourite interview ever. It's with Tony Bennett, which was amazing. <laughs> How we? That's oh my a God. good one. That's a and good one. He was lovely and, you know, 84 or something. And he was sitting on this little, in this fancy room in this Park Lane hotel on this bench that looked like a sort of bench you'd wait for a bus on, <laughs> which I think I put that in the piece. And we just sit <laughs> on this bench. And um, he was so lovely. And he could have talked about, um, Amy Winehouse had recently died. And he talked about how he thought cannabis should be legalized because, um, and, and because he was talking about kind of drugs and how people are dr driven to different kinds of drugs and all this kind of stuff. And there was this headline, and it was like, you kind know, of um, um, legalized cannabis. Tony Bennett talks about this, and it was this piece that was about um, pe things people have learned in their lives, a piece called Word to the Wise, which used to be in Word magazine, and things that he thought should happen or things that should be done. And it was obviously a quite a provocative headline, but he talked about it so intelligently because this is a man who had been a drug addict and overcome it himself and all this stuff. And the best thing about that interview was that he did an autograph for my Auntie Velma, which uh, she had framed on her sideboard, which is very <laughs> Brilliant. I love that. <laughs> Want really. Want no, no, that's, that's sweet. No, that's lovely. I mean, like, I'd be, yeah. If I had your job, I'd be so tempted on many occasions to just like proper fun girl it and be like, oh. I just have. What's the? What's your favorite? What's your favorite part of the job? You know, there's there's something where you're just like, I could not stop doing this job because this is the thing that I love the most about it. I love it when you see it in the, in the magazine, the interview in the magazine or the newspaper, and you read it and go, Yeah, I've done a really good job there. I I just love. I, I don't like just before you meet the person because I'm always really nervous. And when I was teaching journalism students, it's like they were like, "Oh, I get so nervous." It's like I get nervous. Every journalist gets nervous. Well, not every journalist, but lots of us do. Um, but like, if you just have a rapport with somebody and you get something out of it. it I, I love doing interviews. I love it. It's like I've met so many interesting people. And I, what I've really, really loved now, as an old timer, <laughs> you know, I've been doing this since I was 25, 42 now. It's when you interview somebody and they remember you. Like I did a thing, a phone interview last year with Neil Tennant from the Pet Shop Boys, who was one of my childhood heroes, you know. And yeah. and obviously Jarvis Cocker, I've done quite a lot of stuff with him and kind of, you know, oh, and like, you know Jarvis is recently. He's like, all right, Jude, how's it going? I was at Abu Ghani, you know. And it's just like this, he sort of, you know, you think, oh my God, this person whose records they used to buy, you know, knows where I live. Like Neil Tennant was asking me, how's your little boy doing? You know, it's like, Neil Tennant, Jesus. And I know that journalists shouldn't say that probably because, you know, I don't do this because I'm a mad fan girl, but you know, it helps. But um, I love, you know, I love how music kind of makes those connections with people and it still makes connections with me. And, you know, it's lovely to think of yourself as a young fan and you've written about these people so much and you've explored their lives or you found out what, what music they're into at the moment and all this stuff. And it's like the stuff you really wanted to know when you were like 14 in your bedroom. And, you know, it's, it's, it's so thrilling, you know, and I, but I won't let that colour how I feel about their records. You know, I've not given all of the Petra Boys stuff I've written, you know, PLS reviews, because I don't think you should do that. You should be honest. Um, and similar with Jarvis as well, but... Um, I just love that. It's like, oh my God, how lucky am I? This is wonderful, you know, it's really great. Are there things that you'd like, are there things that you purposely will hold back? Because yeah, in your head, you're kind of planning one day, I'm going to write the book. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Just like one day, I'm not going to tell this anecdote here and blah, blah, blah. Because it's just, you've got this wealth of stories that aren't, because you know, there's always the word count that you have to adhere to so often as well. Yeah. And there's like little daft bits that might not be relevant in that interview, but then do you ever like imagine later on, you know, I am going to tell these stories about these people in another I, format somehow? I'm planning to, I'm planning to, to be honest. And I've been writing something for a while, which I'm, yeah. But um, to be honest, I'm not, you know, there's no kiss and tells. 
you know, I'd better... <laughs> oh, that's my next question. <laughs> oh, I've always been with people when I've, uh, you know, been a music journalist oh. with the same person, to be honest, uh, who's in a band, but not the band. He's in a band. <laughs> um, but um, oh, I've got the question now. See, this, this is what happened. No, just about like, when's the book coming out? When's the book coming out? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Got my my proposal, um, you know. So, uh, but yeah, there's um, yeah, there's there's not kind of there's there's little things that you leave out of interviews, like uh, you know. I remember kind of you know when you could have have a drink afterwards, or I can remember going. One of my my first interna international job was kind of yes. um, interviewing James Blunt and his um, uh, before he was famous before you're beautiful. Um, you know, he is actually really funny and, and good laugh and doesn't take himself seriously. No, I'm not a fan of the music, and I think he knew that. But, um, like, his band afterwards, they were like, you know, some slightly Larry behaviour going on. But, you know, you, sometimes you put that in, sometimes you don't. I mean, it depends on who you, you're right, right there for, I guess. But um, I've never had any really terrible experiences. And what I have had, um, people have been rude to me in interviews. I've just put it in. Yeah, but I think I never understand that behaviour. I just don't get it. I mean, I understand people being rude <laughs> for, for certain reasons. When you're a musician who is essentially advertising and promoting your work, rude to a music journalist. What you do, you, you, what is it? It kind of, you know, to spite your face. What yeah. are you doing? Like, these are the people who are going to... And also, these aren't the monsters, actually. These are just... This is, this is facilitating, and it's, it's, so there's a mutual respect there. And I never understand that behavior. And I think if I was a journalist, I'd be inclined to be like, right. <laughs> so, but you have, you have had some of those, but those experiences where people have yeah. just been... Yeah, the, the who... one, well, so the, the worst I had with somebody who wasn't a musician, actually. There was this um, scientist, science writer called Ben Goldacre, who I interviewed and was just rude from start to finish. And my editor said, just write it up. Just write it up. I did. Um, yeah. It's all on tape, so you know I wasn't lying. Um, Alex, Turner, <laughs> Alex Turner from the Arctic Monkeys was really, really rude. Was he? Uh, yeah, he was awful. Why? Um, How was he so rude? I was in doing a piece. I had a very brief career writing for the Enemy <laughs> um, in my early thirties. Far too old to write for the Enemy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, James McMahon, who I know you're speaking to him maybe could have um he yeah. asked me to do a couple of pieces for them and um yeah I, I Alex Turner was moving to New York with his then girlfriend Alexa Chung and you know um I wanted to find out you know him moving to New York how's this gonna work his band's based back in the UK how's this gonna work is it gonna split the band blah 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 and I had to kind of push for a slightly you know for the news angle and he was yeah. just like I'm not going to tell you anything. I know what you want, Jude Rogers. You know, he was like this being, you know, he basically thought he was John Lennon you know, then that, with that kind of level of wit, but he didn't have it, unfortunately. And he wouldn't answer any questions. He was like, you're not enjoying this very much, are you? I could not in his accent, obviously. Um, and, and I, in the end, I just went full, you know, Welsh, you know, no mess in with him. And I was like, right, listen, I've been asked for this interview. You knew it was happening. You were told by your press that you wanted, you should do it. That you decided to do it. If you didn't want to do it, why bother? You know, why bother? Why waste my time? You know, you can either answer these questions or not. You know, um, is it because the enemy will want an interview from me? And I was like, oh, don't be a prick. You know, I just, I just thought I'm just going to tell him. <laughs> I love you. And the sad thing is, you know, yeah, okay, he was, you know, this is like five years into the Arctic Monkeys career, and you know, incredibly talented guy, brilliant lyricist, great singer. I remember around the time was Cornerstone out at the time, which I saw I loved. And I was like, oh, what a shame, you know. And and I listened to, I can't, I can't really listen to them in the same way anymore. I like listen to the early stuff, but anything past that point where I interviewed him, I'm like, no, he's an arsehole. <laughs> he changed it. But I like how you, like, you attempt to do his accent, then you're like, no, I can't do his accent. Mate, <laughs> even he can't do his accent. It changes all the time. He becomes more Richard Hall. He goes really American, then he just goes, really Richard Hawley. He goes he proper Richard. He just tries to like emulate him in every sense. Oh, what I hate is like, you're talented, but you don't have to be a prick. You, you know, don't you know. And I, you know, not all journalists are trying to get, you know, a headline for the sun or whatever. You know, I'm just, I want to write about, you know, tell me about moving to New York. Why, how do you think it was by you? Well, I don't know, I don't live there yet. You know, okay, well, you know, but, are you, you know, are you going there because of Alexa, which is fine, you know, I, 
I'm not an arsehole. You know, I know you, I know people will not yeah. necessarily be in the stairs. I might not know what their approach is, but you know. Well, there we go. I, I wrote a piece. Been... I couldn't really be mi that mean about him as well. And that was the last piece I wrote for the enemy. I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> yeah. you Here you go. I quit. But there's times where, obviously, before you were talking about, like, well, I made you, but Marianne Faithfuls, that you went to her apartment. And then there's like, you know, you were saying it got cut, you had to be cut short because you had to travel back. But no. are there times where it's like you go to somebody's home or, you know, or to a pub or a bar or whatever setting and they're just like, do you want to just stay? Should we just hang out for a bit? Yeah, I did that with John Grant. I, did, I went to, I did a piece for him with like his nine favourite records. Yeah. And I was in the pub with him for about five hours and I just like, <laughs> And I just have to say, I've got to go now. <laughs> I didn't really want to go because he was so great. But um, yeah, I, it is lovely when you just have that, you know, kind of like you must 40 minutes and we'll give you a five minute warning before the end. And you know, that, that's really, really stressful when you have, you know, you have a 20 minute window to interview somebody, you know, and you're like, you know, it's very stressful. They just watch in the pop. But um, yeah, John Grant, I think that was my record. Five That's hours. a good one. Five hours of John Grant, pretty I, bloody good. You, because he talked about his records. We're just chatting. We're just having a, having a gas, and he he was he was great. And yeah, yeah this was um, around the time of Pale Green Ghosts, and you know we were just talking about the nineteen eighties synth pop. I was in my element. I loved it. He'll give you keys to his Iceland apartment after that. That's <laughs> brilliant. That's yeah. brilliant. Are there like because it's, oh oh actually there was um, obviously there's interviewing musicians. I mean, obviously, face to face, I imagine, is your favourite. I yeah. imagine. Yeah. And then, but then also, an article of yours, which is um, just the other day, and it's about, it's about, what's it about? It's about, um, I've got it written down here. I found the roots of electronic music in a cupboard, the tale <laughs> of India's lost techno pioneers. So there's this radio documentary on yeah. BBC Three, uh, BBC Radio Three at the minute. And yeah. I hadn't heard about it. And obviously I hear about it via your review of that. And I forget this is another world of your music journalism when you're talking about radio shows about music. And the way that you describe that is so glorious. I assume that you must be the person who made the documentary. <laughs> I'd have loved to. But that was, um, that piece, um, my editor could have came, Ben, who's the music editor of The Guardian, came to me and said, there's this radio show coming out. Do you want to write about it? And I was like, yes. I really like writing about, you know, I love electronic music, um, uh, but, you know, I knew nothing about Indian electronic music, but it was a great story. I love those jobs, actually. You know, um, so I had to listen to this documentary. I had to interview a couple of people. I had to interview this guy who had composed this early um, Moog stuff, Moog Moog stuff, um, like early 60s, uh, late 60s, early 70s, who then gave it all up because his family wouldn't let him make up music. You know, zooming this guy in Puerto Rico early last week, you know, and ask, you know, I love those jobs. I, lo I actually really love jobs when I don't know loads about the subject, but you've got to, yeah. I get really stressed about them because I think, am I doing this right? Am I, you know, I'm making sure you've got every single fact correct so you're not misinterpreting or misrepresenting somebody's experience. But yeah, there's loads of great, um, you know, radio is a really great place for storytelling about music and yeah that's a brilliant documentary it's called electronic india it's on radio three and it'll be on i play it for a while but it's really good really interesting crazy you know bass compositions from uh from the gujarat in like 1969 it's great <laughs> it's amazing but the, there's like you were saying earlier on that you you were lecturing in mm. in what in music journalism specifically no um like feature writing so yeah from 2010 to 2016 yeah i taught mm -hmm. in metropolitan university part-time and i did like two or three modules a week i'm a child of teachers and i always had that teaching bug I, I wanted to be a lecturer initially or a music journalist and then i became i just went the wrong way <laughs> wrong, wrong, wrong way around about it um and then t uh, until last year, so, so 2016 moved out to London to where I live now on the Welsh borders. And I was teaching for three years in the University of Gloucestershire in Cheltenham, which has a really fantastic, um, you know, accredited uh, 
uh, NTT Day journalism course. I was teaching feature writing and stuff like that. So I'd be like, right, today we're going to do this news story. And like, I'd teach them how to do, write different intros and structure and all this stuff and how to interview people in different ways, strategies to use. It was, it was an amazing thing to do the, the last uh, 10 years because it made me look at how I write and think about how I write and also look at people who's writing I like and how they're different to me. You know, um, I still love reading. There's so many different writers I read and think, I could never write like that, but I love trying to learn stuff from you. You know, people, especially, you know, people who've been your contemporaries, who've been written in the same newspapers at the same time. And, you know, um, I love reading Laura Barton's stuff. You know, Laura and I have known each other forever. <laughs> and, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's, I just learn lots of different, you know, we, we're different writers, but we kind of, it's like I love, you know, trying to find out stuff about writing still. I don't do you feel like you kind of found your people? Do you know, like, um, when you, when you, like, you know, eventually, like, you know, you're this esteemed music journalist. Do you feel like you've found your people now as well? Like, you know, Miranda saw your name checked here the other week as well. And I'm like, oh, there God. is this. And then John Doran. There's this really, you know, and it just seems like there's a bunch of people who really respect each other's work as well. It, does, it doesn't seem competitive. Like, I, I kind of worried whether it would. Um... I think yeah, it, people who are. I think there's some people who are, but also I think it's people who, you know, they re the people who realise they're really lucky, you know, and that they get paid to write stuff about bands still. You know, it's not all I do, and it would you you couldn't have a career just doing it these days. You could definitely couldn't, and you know, it'd be crazy to think that. I, you know, I write about loads of different things, but um, you know, if I see John, you know, John, I used to work at the quietest offices when I was a freelancer. Just be sat in the corner, just to have some company and. John would be there in his long hair days going, yeah, do metal. And I'd be like, you know. Weirdo. A bit scared of this, John. No, it, no, that's <laughs> brilliant. Funny. Miranda, uh, the, the, my love of music journalism, journalism started by reading smash hits. Uh, my, my first copy, August the 10th, 1988, Brother Beyond on the cover, the first issue. <sighs> she talks about that with you the other week. That's the first issue she was working on, and the issue she talks about her interview. That was my first issue with Smash Hit. Um, How do you retain that information? How do you know it's August the tenth and blah blah blah? Because I have this sort of. I shouldn't say this. My brother, my brother and I. So we've got this sort of pop autism. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. But kind of like my, my brother and I are just insane. Sorry, today. We're insane. Like we can remember, you know, chart positions from nineteen ninety one. Which, which must is... be so handy for your job. No, you know, having I... being being given this like this Mark Lanigan interview. Here's the book. You're going to interview him at night, speed reading, like, oh, shit. But you, you can retain the information like that. Not anymore, sadly. Uh, it's after 10.30, it's all gone. It's all disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. I can remember things from that period of my life really vividly. My, my Friday night obsession are the Top of the Pops reruns on BBC4. And we're in, like, <gasps> my now. And I'm like, I know what's coming next. It's Betty Boo. <laughs> <laughs> who has been um, out of out of all? Cause you've done you've done so many. Out of all the interviews that you've done, which has been your favourite? Oh my god! Or oh, who? Michael Stipe, because he was supposed to be the most difficult interview ever. He was my god as a teenager, um, and I had twenty minutes with him, and it was his one on the last day of the last interview with REM in 2011. And it was great. It was great. I went in with a kind of slightly weird format. This is for the quietest. Um, I said, right, I'm gonna, you're leaving your band. I'm going to give you an exit interview. I'm going to ask you all these questions about, you know, your career's been and how your colleagues have been and what you've improved. And he just, it was just quite a funny format that my friend and um, Andrew Harrison, who had been my features editor and Word, had just told me in the pub, and I thought, why did you do that? And I thought, well, that's great. And I just went in, and he liked it. It was funny. We had a good laugh. We would, um, I wore this T-shirt of this um, place I'd been on. Uh, I'd been recently got married and had been in these, um, wore in this T-shirt from Louisiana, and uh, you know, just sort of near Georgia, where they're from. He was like, oh, we were talking about the Deep South. And, stuff. and I always wear things to interviews that kind of make me feel more comfortable. So I thought, I'll wear a T-shirt from like a cool place down there. He might ask me about it, and he did. And I was like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh. Great, he was really great, and at the end, he was like, That's really I did ask him for a selfie. Um, I always laughed at the end of that year. I was at a party with Dan, my other half, and kind of some other people, and somebody was asking me, you know, What's the best thing that happened to you this year? and I went, You know, without thinking, interviewed Michael Stipe. And Dan went, 
We got married in April. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Michael, Stapleton, Michael Stapleton would have never married me, obviously, <laughs> which is fine. But um, <laughs> was, yeah. Michael Stapleton, or Kylie Minogue, actually, that was a lovely one. She was really great. Ooh. Love Kylie. She was so. She lovely. seems lovely. There was that in excess um, documentary. I love the Kylie. And when Kylie comes in, she seemed. What, what was she like? She was great. You know, she was more revealing than I thought she'd be. But she's not massively revealing. But um, I mainly liked it because her. She's got family still in the Welsh Valleys, and so I went. Right. I always try and ask, have a little point of. Um, commonality kind of at the beginning of to try and you know it if, if it seems like it'll work not to be too cheesy and I said you know this is gonna sound weird but I'm from Swansea and your grand's from my steak and I really want to ask her about that you know do you know anyone she went yeah my nine she still lives in my steak I said I can speak a bit of Welsh I was the first five minutes is her trying to say clan you know that long place name in North Wales oh can you say it um I can Google that that is brilliant. Okay, yeah, carry on. Just, just check in. But Kylie trying to say that is hilarious. I've got this. I've still got that on tape. A day. But um, mm. if you have those little moments that are just a bit surreal and funny and a bit smash hits, you know, with um, somebody who's like that. And I've got a great. Uh, yeah, I don't take photos of everybody, by the way. But I do have a picture of me. I'm really heavily pregnant, standing next to Kylie, and I think my stomach is bigger than Kylie. Below. <laughs> That's lovely though, because it's like when you're a little lad, when he grows up. You'd be like, look, there's me, Kylie, and you. Like, he's, <laughs> no, they're fun. They're fun. They're fun, beautiful moments. And they're like, the, those things are lovely to, to cherish. I think they're just gorgeous. There's, um, oh, I, uh, I, there's a comment from um, somebody says, pedophile. Oh, it's, oh it's, it's, it's my friend Bez. Hi, Bez. Hey, Bez. Bez. The Welsh person. What's perfect? Perfect. Perfect in Welsh. Oh, I love it. I love it. Who is, is there somebody that you haven't interviewed yet that you're just desperate to, where you're like, I just, or that you, yeah, who? Oh my God. Um, who haven't I interviewed? The other, it's funny because. Who, who haven't I interviewed? No, no, no. no. I, yeah, there's lots of people I haven't interviewed. I would, <laughs> I would have said Chrissy Hind before, kind of. Um, they're like, there's people I think I, I would want to interview Madonna. I think I'd be too scared. Um, yeah, I think I'd be disappointed. I'd be scared. Um, you can be mean. Somebody I've always wanted to interview. It's not a musician. I've always wanted to interview Julie Walters, the actor. I, I think She's my favourite. She's my favourite human. But I, I, it's it's funny because there was always like I've always wanted to interview Jarvis, and then I you know wrote a script for Jarvis for this ABBA exhibition a few years ago where he did the tapes, and that was just nuts. Was, was that like, at the Was that at the the um, Royal Festival Hall? No, South Bank Centre. Yeah. You yeah. did that. I wrote the script for Jarvis. Yeah, you know, he he could, you know, get rid of some of my jokes he wanted to. He did get rid of some bits, but kind of <laughs> the, the bits where I was making him sound particularly saucy. He was pretty upset. Um, yeah, that was great. But, um, um, yeah, could have, uh, I, should, I should have thought short about this. I'll think of somebody straight. No, somebody. dude, no, what? It's, it's, no, it's, it's just proof of the. F oh, have you interviewed PJ Harvey? I'd like to. I know she doesn't do them very often, but, um, you know, I really loved her, you know, kind of early on. And I've always been a bit nervous, you know, kind of interview. If you interview somebody who's such a kind of artist and they're quite eccentric and they're quite distant, it can be quite weird. But I interviewed Bjork about 10 years ago, maybe more than 10 years ago, and she was great. You know, God, I'd, I'd love to interview her again, actually. But, um, but yeah, somebody, po yeah, Polly. Polly Harvey, that would be amazing. Yeah, this, this, this is all good advice for me as a musician. I'm thinking, like, just stop answering the phone. Can you do this interview? Yeah, but no, say no. Um, <laughs> Bruce Springsteen. I like to interview people oh, who, you know, you do the same interviews with the same people all the time. Although, actually, yeah. I think Laura Barton should interview Bruce Springsteen, and I'm amazed she hasn't interviewed him yet. Um, there's some people who just get the same, they'll get the same, it's generally blokes, I should, you know, and I'm not, you know, there's some, there's some f wonderful male music journalists out there. But, um, yeah, but there's less female journalists. Yeah, I was lucky in my first job at Word to basically be said, right, go and interview Robert Plant, you know, and go, go and interview the kind of people that generally an older, gen probably white man would go and interview. Um, but yeah, I like being, you know, you know throw me to somebody like that, you know, kind of, uh, you know, Willie Nelson. 
you know, oh God, he would be amazing. Somebody like that. I'd love Willie Nelson. Yeah, Willie Nelson. Ooh, juicy, juicy. And I think at a time where it's like, it's just, it's a, it's a worry that, um, why do you think, because, because it is in jeopardy, so many great, great, great publications are in real trouble right now. Loud and Quiet is just one of many at the moment. That's the newest. A stool pigeon when that left, that was a travesty. And oh. there, are other, there are others on the way, and it's really sad. Why do, you think that it, why, why do you think music journalism is so important? Why do we need it? Do we need it? I think we need it, you know, because I've got mortgage. I'm gonna... <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, well, I bloody need it. <laughs> yeah, hey, mummy, mummy needs new shoes. <laughs> yeah. I need big feet. Um, and also, I need it as well for my <laughs> job. Okay, um, why, okay, not why do you and I why, need it? I rephrase that question. Not no, why I, I need it or why you need it, but why does I the bigger fiction? I, when I, I don't read people like, uh, you know, I trust about music, then I find there's so much stuff out there. Where do you start? You need people you, to kind of guide you through it. Um, you know, and, and I, I think half the fun of listening to an album and loving an album and getting lo lost in the world of that artist is finding out about them or reading an interview about them or, you know, kind of reading a, a great review. Like I, I read without fail Alexis Petridis's lead reviews in The Guardian every week because he's honest and he's funny and... He's never rude, you know, he can, he's rude in a funny way, but can, he's never mean. Um, and I feel like I know what's going on in pop music, you know, because I, I, we, we've all got, you know, we haven't got infinite amounts of time, have we? And I, but I'd quite like to know what's going on in general, just even if I wasn't writing about music, you know, even if I'm just a fan, you know, I, I want to know the latest record by X is like, or, Char, you know, Charlie XCX or, I don't know, 1975 or whatever, you know, whoever it is. I, look, I want to know what's going on. And to read something that's entertaining and educational, you know, and gives you an insight into that world or you find out about that, that artist that's inspired by a certain thing. You know, I find it, I still find it really exciting. And, you know, just having a WAV file or an MP3 is not the full picture. You know, I'm saying this to, to, you, know, to you, you know, um, and I should say that she hasn't, I give her a very good review in, in Mojo this month and she, that she hasn't paid me beforehand because I think your new album's amazing. But I love the fact that your new album is, it's not just the songs, it's the, it's the cover art, it's the videos, it's kind of, it's the whole process. And I think the interviews um, you do and other stuff, the insight you get into the artist world is uh, as important. When I got into music as a young person, it was obviously the songs, but it was, you know, chancing upon a record cover in Woolworths in Tlethley or Sullivan's in Gosinan, or it was <laughs> reading an interview in the maker. Remember, the first time I, you know, could have got, uh, this is probably a bad example, the first time I got into Evan Dando was probably seeing a picture of him in the person maker going, oh, he's there. Um, yeah. um, but, you know, kind of, you get interested in artists because of this wider world that they're in. And I think music journalism is part of that. And if it goes, then we're just, you know, you see how things are going with the way that, you know, playlists and algorithms on Spotify just take to, you know, chill out or whatever. It's like, music is not just about, you know, making you, you know, it's not background. I really, it's not wallpaper. It's the fuel of your lives and you know, these important moments in your life. And, and you know, still, you know, I'm, I look, I, music still excites me so much and it kind of, it, ties me into these pivotal moments in my life so much um and music journalists have helped that they've kind of filled out that story yeah, yeah. i'm really oh no you, you couldn't have said it any more perfectly jude like um yeah i worry about the kind of the future of of of, of how we ingest music where it's like i remember being in marks and spencers with me mum not for the big shop just for the bits and um <laughs> You could buy like um, these these plate like these these um, CD compilations like music for Sunday lunch, music for dinner party compilations, and I'm like, my mum was like, oh, we should get one of these, and I'm like, well, bloody shit, and that is this is where I I don't want to see music being reduced to just playlists that were just spoon fed like this. I want to hear what you have, think about stuff. Yeah, as long as you have everything else as well as that. I did have a, an album my mum used to have when we used to go on holidays called Reflections, which was oh, loads of ambient tunes and um, 
It had Albatross by Fleetwood Mac. It had... <laughs> Let's go on. I loved it. Great. But it's brilliant. <laughs> and so, 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 you know, or did I have Tokyo got it? I remember, but, you know, there's all these bands, you know. You could have a bit of that, but not all. That ain't bad. That. Not too much of that. Not but there's, much. um, unfortunately... The saddest thing about these interviews, bloody hell, I wish, hopefully I can get you to do a part two at some point. Um, we only have an hour and a few minutes remaining. Um, what has been, I mean, it's a bit of a, it's a, it's a big question. Uh, what's been your proudest moment in your career as a music journalist? If you can think of one. Um, a proudest moment. I think when that issue of Q came out, just to see, you know, Paul McCartney in a cover magazine said, I wrote that. Which sounds really egotistical, but it's like, it's Paul McCartney from the Beatles. You know, and somebody thought it would be good enough to interview him. You know, my personal experience aside. Um, I think, you know, I still think back to my first job working at Word, you know, on Word as a magazine. And, you know, some people this will remember it and some won't. It could have folded in 2012. But it was a magazine that was trying to not put musicians up on a pedestal and worship them, but be funny and informative and all this stuff. It was a great magazine. Working with those people, and I think that's why I feel proud of now, you know, working with people like Andrew Harrison, who does, you know, political podcasts now and also does a brilliant Big Mouth uh, pop culture podcast, but pe being with him, Mark Ellen and David Hepworth, who did the Live Aid coverage in 1985, Paul Denoyer, who is a journalist and writer that, if you don't know his writing, go and look at his website after this. He's an amazing Liverpudlian writer. He's just, he's just amazing. One of the best writers about Bowie and the Beatles. Just fantastic. God, that's who I would like to be interviewed as David Bowie, obviously. But that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> not now. Um, not now. Let's do a seance. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I... This is going to sound really cheesy, but, you know, I'm managing to write about bands I really love and you know, and having a career which is really exciting and interesting. And I, that, that makes me, you know, I don't know if it'll last, don't, I don't know if it'll last forever, don't think it'll last forever. Hopefully it will last for a bit. But, um, you know, I just, I, I, li I, and I like being, I think being proud is, is something about, you can, when you write something about a band and you see them kind of go on, actually. i tell you one thing I really loved. When I wrote the first article of the XX in a broadsheet in 2010, um, and they were these, young kids in a garage in Putney trying to make their album. They just finished their album. They were really shy. And like 15 months later, they won the Mercury. And- Must be nice. And, and it, was, it was great. You know, I'm a, I would be a terrible A&R because I've seen bands go, they'll never get anywhere. Or, you know, they're Colbert. Or they'll never get anywhere. Or the Mumford and Sons, whatever. But um, they were a band of champion from early on. And I saw, you know, see them. I thought that was great, actually. That, you thought, oh, you know, not that it was thanks to me, <laughs> but- you know, you gave them a little bit of a push in the early days, which got them a bit more press or might have, you know, might have helped a little bit. Lots of folk musicians I write about, you know, I know that, and the Guardian's folk column. The Lisa, the Lisa Hannigan one you did recently was beautiful. Lisa Hannigan. Yeah. Lisa O'Neill. Yeah, Lisa... she's amazing. Lisa O'Neill? Of... Not Lisa. Mm -hmm. I'm... I write with Lisa Hannigan recently. She's good as well. I can't remember. Yeah, Lisa... Uh... Well, I can't remember I've written it, basically. Lisa Knapp is amazing as well. But um, writing about those musicians really makes a difference to their careers because if they can yeah. say, I'm a four-star review in The Guardian, that will get them gigs. You know, obviously not right now. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but small, I, 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 I like to be able to champion bands that you know you'll make a bit of a difference because they, they exist in worlds that need those pushes, really. Honestly, Jude, you do. And it's like... Um... You know, you encourage me to go and listen to this radio documentary. You facilitate my career, as many as so many other musicians. But as a music fan and a fan of music journalism, thank you so much for oh, all... No, but honestly, for all the music you've introduced me to and thousands and thousands and thousands of others, like, you, you're a superstar. Right? Oh. A, proper, a proper superstar. And you do your job so well. And, like, I'm properly grateful and oh. honestly, it's, it's, it's been bright. I'm going to send, if you don't mind after this, if you can point us in the direction of a few articles of yours. It'll take us hey. some time to sift through all of them. But, you know, ones to, you know, for us to read at the moment, because honestly, I'm taking so much pleasure out of reading your work at the oh. moment. Thank well, thank you for being somebody who's fun to interview and always says something entertaining. <laughs> it's really pretty. <laughs>
<laughs> send on my drunk. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, well, I really, I really appreciate it. And hopefully we can do a part two at some point as well. But um, okay. take care of yourself and look yeah, to the family. Too. Thank, Thank you, you, buddy. Toronto. Bye. Bye. <laughs>